Once again, welcome to the first program in our series with the Midcoast Audubon. I'm going to turn the program over to Will to tell you a little bit about their organization and tonight's talk. Will? Great. Great. Thanks, Julia. And thanks to the Camden Public Library for hosting our nature talk series. Once again, my name is Will Broussard, and I'm a board member at Midcoast Audubon. As a reminder, we're a member supported chapter of Maine Audubon with a mission to promote long term responsible use of natural resources through informed membership, education and community awareness. In addition to tonight's program, we'll be hosting Eric Masterson for a talk on nocturnal flight calls on October 21st and Paul Vanek will be speaking about a year in the lives of North American owls on November 18th. So you don't want to miss those. We have field trips also coming up to Popham Beach and Sabattis Pond. So stay tuned to our website for updates and registration information. Now turning to our speaker um, tonight, we are so happy to have David Gavatsky. He is a naturalist and author. He's retired after 33 years with the U.S. Forest Service. He's always loved trees and forests and continues to study and visit forests around North America. I'm very excited to introduce my friend and fellow nature nerd, David Gavatsky, with all of you tonight. Thank you. Well, th thank you, Will. And... Um... Thank you, Julia, for um, inviting me to do this program. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen right now. And, and we'll while Dave does that, I want to mention, I forgot to tell you, if you have questions for David, please type them into the Q&A box. You see a little icon at the bottom of your screen for that, and we'll take questions at the end of the program. Thank you, David. Please proceed. I can see your slide, and it looks great. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Julie, and the volume's okay? Yes, sounds wonderful. All right, so welcome to my program on ancient trees of um, North America. Um, we're gonna take a, a travel tour, and it won't just be trees. I will be talking about some, some of the birds that we have in these ancient forests. Uh, I've been interested in old growth forests and ancient trees for a long, long time. Um, in fact, I was, I was married uh, my wife and I were married next to a tree that was uh, nearly 500 years old in the Quinault rainforest of um, uh, the Olympic Peninsula in Washington. So um, I really, really enjoy that. I'm not gonna have a lot of uh, slides with uh, words on them because I think pictures are, are really more important, but I did wanna define what ancient trees are. And essentially they're, they're trees that are um, reached a great age in comparison with others of the same species. And, Depending on where you are in the country, uh, for instance, uh, in the United, Eastern United States and New England, a white birch or a paper birch, I mean, it'd be pretty ancient at 150 years old. And hemlock, well, they live a lot longer. So 400 years old, is uh, it would be considered ancient. But, but there's several species of trees in the Western United States that exceed 2000 years of age. And we actually have, we know of at least uh, eight trees that are that are well over 4,000 years, including one, um, the Methuselah tree, which is 4,851 years old, that's living in the White Mountains of California. Uh, we'll be talking about the White Mountains um, of California, not New Hampshire. There's also White Mountains in Arizona and, and Alaska, but uh, we'll, we'll be mentioning that. I did have a handout that I, uh, Julia sent out earlier. It just has, uh, you know, some of the ages of the oldest eastern trees, and I'll be talking about um, several of those. I'll, I'll have pictures of them and where you might be able to see them. But first, let's take a look at the tools of the trade. Um, I'm a forester and a silviculturist. Um, silviculture is essentially the art and science of managing forest, and, and I had a, a, a wonderful career in the U.S. Forest Service, and, and I've, I've still been very active in, um, uh, in silviculture and forest ecology and, and that. And one of our tools that we use in, in aging trees is called an increment bore. And yes, you can, you can cut down a tree with a chainsaw and count the rings, but that's a little bit destructive. Whereas uh, an increment bore, uh, it's a tool that's made in Sweden. There's, there's one factory uh, that makes two different brands. Um, and it consists of a handle, which is the orange piece, an auger, which is the drill piece, and an extractor or a spoon that takes out the core sample. 
And this is what a core looks like. It's a pencil thin. And the objective is to hit the center of the tree called the pith and, uh, and, and then to extract the core that, so then you can count the rings. Now, different trees have different kinds of um, uh, difficulty in, in, in counting the rings. And, and I've experienced, uh, uh, you know, trying to count oak rings and trying to count uh, sugar maple and things like that. They're pretty hard. You really have to work on it, sand them down and, and get it. But, but many of the pines, the spruce, they're very, very easy to uh, count. You can see the alternating bands of um, dark and, and light rings. So what are those rings? And so, um, and how do you do it? Uh, essentially, you want to, you want to start at the first year's growth. And you can see where my cursor is. That's, we call that the pith. That's, that's the first year, you know, depending on where you're measuring it in the tree, you might have to add a few years uh, for the growth. Uh, you can look at this lower image here, and you can see what we call the early growth, uh, or spring wood, which is very light. And, and that's really what carries a lot of water tends to grow the fastest. And then you have the late wood or the uh, summer late summer wood, and that's the dark ring. And those typically are, are a lot easier to count. And so what I typically do is I start at the center and I count the dark rings on the way out. Um, here you can see some, some differences in the growth in this diagram. And you can tell that in, during a rainy season in this particular case, there was a lot of moisture available for the tree. And so the, the ring is much wider and it, it grew more. And then the dry season didn't, really grow as fast. So that's, that's how you tell the difference. Now, tree rings are used for many, many things. And, and the science of tree ring measurements is called dendrochronology. And a person who, who does this kind of work is a dendrochronologist. And they're also called tree ringers, lords of the rings, and you know, so forth. But uh, we'll use the the Latin, um, I'm sorry, the Greek name dendros for, for trees and chronology, chronos for, for time. And in this particular case, um, a scientists are able to determine where forest fires occurred at, at various ages uh, on this particular tree, which is a ponderosa pine. And tonight, the species we're going to cover, we're going to start with the, with the oldest trees and then work our way back um, on up. We'll start with the bristlecone pine in California and two other species closely related, the foxtail pine we'll also discuss, uh, and the sequoia and get into the redwoods a little bit. White bark pine in Oregon, um, we'll talk about aspen in Utah, bald cypress in North Carolina and some other species that we have here in the, in the East. So let's take a journey through the oldest known living forest. And uh, perhaps some of you have, have been out here uh, near Lone Pine or uh, Bishop, California, and you've had a, uh, a trip up to the ancient bristlecone pine forest. It's a spectacular place. Every time I go there, I, I mean, it's like, I think you're in heaven when you're at a, at a place like that. So it's on the Inyo National Forest um, and it's up at about 10,000 feet in elevation in the White Mountains of California. It's a paved road that goes up for, um, it's about 10 miles up uh, from another highway, um, easily accessible. I mean, some people even will take a bicycle and bicycle on up that, um, and, and uh, you start at about 10,000 feet. So if you're not accustomed to the altitude, it, it, it takes a little while to get used to it. Um, the Shulman Grove Visitor Center, again, is near Bishop and Lone Pine, California. It's named for um, one of the early scientists who covered um, uh, research in the Bristol Pine Forest. So lovely visitor center, you can buy books trophy t-shirts if you want. Um, there's restrooms and, and there's a couple of um, forestry staff there that can answer your questions. So if you're thinking about going to California, this is in the eastern part of the state. You can see Death Valley uh, from the summit here. Uh, it's, it's not on the, on the western side. So bristlecone pines, they, they have some real secrets of, of old age. 
one of the things is they conserve their energy. They keep their needles for 30 to 40 years. And you may know that our Eastern white pine, the state tree of Maine, uh, loses about a third of its needles every year. So, you know, essentially uh, all the needles are changed every, every three years. Um, the trees grow very, very slowly for very dense and resinous wood. Um, it resists any type of uh, fungus and, and, and decay like that. And they can stay alive with, with no bark. So there's this, this balance between the amount of live tissue and, and nutrients that are available. So you could have a tree that has lost 90% of its bark, but because of the nutrient uh, supplies that's available in, in the ground where it's at, you know, that's perfectly fine. So it's really well adapted to it. And they grow where forest fires can't spread. You don't get forest fires in these bristle cone pine forest. They tolerate these soils, these dolomite. Um, dolomite's a type of limestone, has a high magnesium content. And most other trees cannot grow in this kind of a soil. Very, very alkaline. And they only get 10 to 12 inches of moisture per year. And the growing season is, is quite short, 45 days. Um, and so Methuselah, 4,851 years old this year, and it's still alive. It germinated over 48 centuries ago. And this is not uh, Methuselah. They, uh, I actually do not know which tree I saw, but as, as the ranger said, if you had your eyes open on this 4.2 mile walk, you saw Methuselah. So it was, it was one of those trees out there, uh, but it's a spectacular hike if you uh, ever want. In fact, it's worth making a trip to California just to go. You can fly out to Las Vegas, get a rental car, and uh, in three hours, you could be, you could be out there. So um, the bristle cone is named for the bristles actually on the cone, as you can see here. Uh, cones a couple inches in, in, um, in length. And it has a bottle brush needle arrangement. Bottle brush or foxtail, you might call it, uh, needle arrangement where the needles completely encircle the, the twig. And as you can see here. Um, and you have cones. These are the male pollen cones that develop and these are they have a windblown pollen it's a yellow pollen you're probably familiar with seeing spruce and pine pollen on your cars in the in the springtime uh, and those tend to fertilize the female cones and this is a five needle pine and most of the five needle pines are it takes two years for them to mature the female cones are really quite attractive they're typically purple sometimes they're they're green uh, and here's a picture showing you three different kinds of cones. You have the one-year-old seed cone, kind of a crooked little cone here. And then you have the male pollen cone, and then you have the female cone that's here. And these cones can stay on the trees for you know, 50, 60, 70 years. They often, as many of these Western uh, species of trees, they often see uh, three or four cones that come in this little clump here. We have pitch pine in, in Maine and, and New Hampshire and Massachusetts, uh, and very, very similar. You get these clusters of, of three cones. Uh, the bark looks like, you know, kind of plates. In this particular case, it was fairly intact. It was a younger tree. Um, it's an orange color. Um, very attractive bark. Uh, and the trees, the, um, the Great Basin bristlecone pines here in the White Mountains of California, also uh, Great Basin National Park, Wheeler Peak in Nevada, um, they, they grow on these dolomite soils. And dolomite, as I said, is a limestone with a high magnesium content. Uh, dolomite's actually this, this rocky material that reflects the sunlight. It's a almost a white color. And so it's typically two to four degrees cooler than the surrounding uh, area, which has mostly sandstone. Uh, you don't find any of the bristle cones growing on the sandstone. And there's very little fuel for forest fires when you have your needles staying on the trees for up to 40 years. And this is the trail. It's, it's not all flat like that, but uh, this is the north aspect. And this is actually one of the wetter sides of um, 
uh, of the Shulman Grove. And you can see they're, they're scattered uh, quite a ways apart. It's a, it's a wonderful hike um, if you ever get a chance to do it. <clears throat> so they're able to survive for a long period of time with you know, only 10% of their bark. It's, it's, it's like just a strip that's there. And they are really quite gnarly. And they just, these roots, sometimes they extend out 50 feet in all directions from the tree. They just wrap around the, the rocks. And they're really quite scenic. And they also have the ability to sprout from the bark if a branch is lost. So if a tree is injured, they, they do have that ability to, to re-sprout from, from the branch. Um, this is at a, a different grove. This is another 12 miles up the road. Uh, 12 miles, you can drive to it, but make sure you have some spare tires. Two, two spare tires would be a good idea. It's sharp rocks on the road, and um, it takes about 45 minutes to an hour to get there. Spectacular ride, bringing you up to um, 12,000 feet. And you see these isolated trees on these ridges and you just wonder, you know, how can these trees, they're ancient trees that have been around for 4,000 years, you know, how can they, how can they survive? Um, there's a, you know, as I said, there's a number of things, you know, it's the climate and they're able to resist these high winds and uh, very little rainfall. Uh, they're able to withstand lightning strikes um, and, and be able to and be able to live. Uh, right now, though, uh, with with climate change, they're starting to regenerate at higher elevations, and so that's a good thing. These these trees are, um, you know, they're about three four feet tall. Some are six feet tall. They're probably a few hundred years old. So the researchers are finding that they are starting to slowly creep further up in elevation. Very photogenic. Um, of course, when you're up at that altitude, the air is usually quite clear and um, temperatures are, are not what you would get in, in Death Valley. That I think the next day we went to Death Valley and it was 117 degrees and it was only about 40 degrees up, up here. So it was a nice, nice change. Um, this, <laughs> this is the bird that is so important uh, to, to many of these Western pines. It's called the Clark's Nutcracker. And it's a species of bird that's really made for these particular pine trees. And the Clark's nutcracker uh, actually collects the cones, gets into the cones and takes the seeds and plants them. It, it stores them. It's in the crow or raven family. It can remember, you know, well over a thousand places where it had uh, uh, cached the seeds for, for winter use. And, and occasionally, you know, the bird will forget or, um, you know, it may uh, have been killed or, you know, move on to another area. Uh, so these trees tend to re-sprout. So without, without this bird, these trees would not do very well. And it's a very loud bird and a fairly large bird. So you can, you can see it flying. Uh, love to see it. Um, I, I recall we were up at Whistler Peak at a, at a ski area and uh, there was cafeteria outside. So we were eating and, and I, I looked over to, um, to another person who went back in, I guess he needed some ketchup for his French fries. And this Clark's Nutcracker came down and stole his French fries. I just loved it. I didn't want to scare the bird. I think the guy thought that uh, somebody stole his French fries. Anyways, Shulman Grove trails. There's um, three trails. The Methuselah Trail, which is, uh, it's actually about 4.2 miles, climbs about 900 vertical feet. Um, that's the really um, good trail to do. The Discovery Trail is about a, a mile, and I think it goes up about 200 feet. And I haven't done the, the Cabin Trail. I've done part of it, but uh, I was more interested in, in seeing the um, Methuselah Tree. So here's what the trail looks like. And, and um, there are benches along the way. Uh, you know, I think about every half mile, there's these wonderful benches and you can just, you know, sit at, at these and just take in the landscape. You can actually see at that other, other at where that bench was, you can see Death Valley. So the, uh, the upper grove called the Patriarch Grove starts at about 11,000 feet and goes up to 11,500 feet. Um, and there's two trails there. Um, and they, they bring you through a, a, another grove of, of trees. 
So let's uh, let's get into dendrochronology a little bit, and and the importance of dendrochronology is that you can use these tree cores and you can cross date. You can get um, a cross date from from various trees, and because the patterns, because of the climate in the southwest. Um, very similar. So you, you have years that there's very little rain and the rings are very close together. And then the normal rainfall years, which normal being, you know, six to 10 inches, uh, they're able to, to expand out. And so you develop these patterns and you can cross date and they've able to have been going back about 12,000 years. Um, and, and, uh, um, they can use it for archaeology. And actually, in the 1960s, carbon-14, we, we've heard about carbon-14 dating. We found out that there's some flaws to carbon-14 testing. Uh, and because of the work that was done in the Southwest and also in this ancient bristlecone pine forest, they were able to calibrate carbon-14 uh, dating. And, and now it's used in archaeology. Um, there's a famous violin called the Messiah. It's uh, made by Stradivarius, a uh, famous uh, violin maker. And there was some question about the authenticity of this violin. That was $20 million violin. So, you know, they said, ah, it couldn't have been. And so they actually had a dendrochronologist check it and verified that in fact, it was produced by this violin maker, Stradivarius. And it's retained its value, but it's used for so many things. It's, it's Viking ships. They've been able to um, determine the date, uh, you know, when they um, um, were, were cut and so forth. So quite famous. Um, oh, and, um, and even the bristlecone pine made it onto the stamp of California. It's the um, oldest um, tree. So they, it was the most important thing they came up with for California. And, yeah, I think about that, you know, Yosemite, bristlecone pine, San Francisco. I guess I'd go with the bristlecone pine, one of my favorite trees. So across the valley, only 30 miles away and also in the Inyo National Forest is the next species of tree that we're going to look at. And that tree is the foxtail pine, Pinus balfouriani. And it's, um, this one was at um, Cottonwood Pass. Um, I think that was about 9,000 feet in elevation. And again, it's, it's closely related to the bristlecone pine. It's in that foxtail pine family. Uh, the oldest tree that they know of is, is over 2,100 years old, but they suspect that the tree could easily live to 3,000 years. And uh, if, if you hike um, on the Pacific Crest Trail in that part of the Sierras, uh, John Muir Trail, you'll often come across these, these foxtail pines. Um, instead of living on the dolomite um, rocks and dolomite soils, the foxtail pine, again, closely related, lives on granite. There's no dolomite over here. So it's, it's these granitic soils where they're found. And it's fairly rare, again, um, it's a high elevation alpine tree, has five needles. And again, it's closely related to the bristlecone pine. You know, you have that bottle brush or foxtail uh, appearance. Uh, and there's two populations. Uh, the one that we were at is in the Southern Sierras, uh, again, near uh, Bishop and Lone Pine, California. And the other is way up north in uh, Northern California, Klamath Mountains and they're disjunct populations. And these trees, I mean, they're, these trees are on sky islands. They're growing at the tops of the mountains as opposed to the bottom. And they're separated uh, by hundreds of miles and they're not about to be able to, to make that distance. So, you know, why um, there's two different populations separated so far, you know, the scientists have pretty well concluded it was a relic of the ice age when the climate was a little bit different. So. But hiking in the foxtail pine, just like um, hiking in, in the bristlecone pine, the, you know, a lot, there's dead trees and these trees will, you know, there's value to them. Um, they're really, you know, quite rugged. They also, they're growing on these uh, very poor soils and quite spectacular. 
Uh, next tree, giant uh, General Sherman. This is a uh, uh, giant sequoia. Giant sequoias are found in California. In fact, in um, Sequoia National Park in California right now is a big forest fire. And last year, we lost 10% of our giant sequoias in a, in a series of forest fires that went through there. So we've got some big fires going on in Sequoia National Park right now. So we may end up losing some of them um, in this current fire. Uh, this is the General Sherman uh, big tree. It's um, it's the you know largest known tree in the world, not by height. The the the, the highest is the uh, coastal redwood, which is over 400 feet tall. Um, the Hyperion tree, which has no trail to it currently, uh, there may be in the future, but um, that they typically are in the 2,000 year old range. But the um, giant sequoias, they can um, you know live for over 3,000 years. Uh, so a, a spectacular tree if you ever get a chance to get out to, um, uh, to Sequoia National Park and Sequoia National Monument, which is run by the Forest Service nearby. So when you look up, you know, take a photograph. These, these trees are just reaching for the sky, hundreds of uh, feet tall. Moving up north, we're going to go to look, take a look at the white bark pine, Crater Lake National Park in, in uh, Oregon, and some of you perhaps have been there. Crater Lake is a, a giant uh, volcanic caldera from Mount Mazama, and it has a younger cone in the center of the, of the lake called Wizard Island, um, and it's a place where white bark pine is um, found. And white bark pine is, uh, again, a high elevation tree. Um, somewhat whitish bark, very, very gnarly appearance. And again, one of those five needle trees. Uh, this one is on Mount Bachelor near Bend, Oregon, uh, just some on volcanic soils. And so you typically see it in these lava lands. And if it's the right elevation, they seem to do pretty well. Cones, and uh, you can see some of the, these are male pollen cones. Again, it's uh, wind pollinated. Five needles. So these are um, rugged trees, but they're also in, in decline. And the problem is, is that white pine blister rust, which we is uh, also affects the eastern white pine and the western white pine. Uh, it's slowly moving further and further uh, up the mountains in, in the western um, region. And you also have a, a pine beetle that is impacting uh, the trees. So it's, it's a real problem. Again, here's another picture of Crater Lake on a, a hike up Mount Garfield. Um, you can see the white bark pine uh, that has a, a mountain pine beetle attack. So the National Park Service and the U.S. Forest Service and, and uh, various universities are working really hard to try to find a way to um, protect the white bark pine because they're so important. They're important for grizzly bears too, because they love to eat the uh, seeds, very high fat content in there. So here they're collecting cones and um, interesting to see what they're doing. They have some repellents that they're testing out. And this was on the Watchman Fire Lookout Trail that um, my wife and I had hiked up to see. And we met actually a, an ecologist who was doing some work uh, with that. So we had a good chance to, to talk with her. So again, Clark's Nutcracker made for each other. They're just so, so important uh, to have the Clark's Nutcracker. Moving over to Utah, we're going to take a look at the limber pine. And these trees can grow well over a thousand years in age. And this is in Bryce Canyon National Park. Again, another one of our um, America's wonderlands. Um, this is right on the edge of the, of the canyon. And you can see that there's some, been some erosion underneath here. And, and uh, that's why these features are here because things are eroding pretty fast. You'll also find uh, limber pine. This is Sandia Crest outside of Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico. This is up around 9,000 feet in elevation. And, and here they actually grow on, on marble, which is... Um, a metamorphized uh, type of limestone. And they're, they're doing really, really well here. So there's some great birding up on the Sandia Crest. There's three different kinds of rosy finches. If you uh, 
yeah, it's it's worth just flying down to Albuquerque just to see the limber pine and the three different kinds of rosy finches that are down there if you're a birder. Uh, so let's take a look uh, also in Utah at the Pando clone. This is a uh, group of quaking aspen on the Fish Lake National Forest in, in Utah. And, and the reason I put this in here, there's there's been there's been some discussions and I had a chance to visit the Pando clone um, a couple of years ago. You know, there's um, people have said that it's uh, they're 80,000 years old. And but the problem is, is the trees themselves are not 80,000 years old. These aspen trees, I think they get up to be about 130 years old in this particular clone. It's the root system that's supposedly the largest living organism that we have on the planet at 106 acres in, in size. And some of the early research actually was done by the National Park Service, but they never really put the references and where they figured out how old this was. I think it was more of an estimate. They're saying you know, it's 80,000 years old for this clonal root system. And Aspen, they, they come up, it's called suckering. Um, and so when a tree dies, you'll, you'll get a sucker that comes up. But, you know, I personally, I doubt the age that it's 80,000 years because you really have to look at the geology, the glacial history of this area and, and uh, the glacial maximum in this area when the glaciers finally retreated off of the off of the mountain range here is about 16,000 years ago. So I doubt that this Aspen clone was, was alive and covered by, by ice because it was a long period of time. But there's others who say that this could be a million years old, but I'm more inclined to think 14 to 16,000 years, but look it up. You might be interested in that. Uh, over in Europe, and I, I know I'm, I'm leaving North America here, to get into another one of these heritage trees. And this is a uh, Norway spruce. And Norway spruce are commonly planted by the Civilian Conservation Corps. So we have a number of them around in, in Maine and New England in general. Uh, and, and the claim is that these are 9,550 years old. Uh, but again, these are clones. Uh, but the BBC published an article uh, a couple of years ago about this particular tree. And there's no spruce anywhere near uh, this location uh, as far as Norway spruce. So they believe that these trees were brought here and planted by uh, the early people, the Mesolithic people that, uh, that were here so thousands of years ago. So uh, that's a very interesting thing. All right, back to North America. Let's take a look. This is a bald cypress uh, that I saw at the Francis Beadler Forest. This is a uh, National Audubon Sanctuary outside of Charleston, South Carolina. Again, it's worth a flight down to Charleston, South Carolina, uh, just to go through this forest. There's a couple miles of boardwalks, and it'll, you'll go through you know, maybe 30 different species of trees, but you, know, you probably see 80 or 90 species of birds out here. And, and this particular bald cypress is um, 1,600 years old. But there's even a bigger one, and I have not seen this one. I've been close to it, and I was hoping to go last year, but because of COVID, I, I didn't get to go. It's only about three miles uh, from the nearest road, and you can canoe out to it. It's a bald cypress that was discovered to be 2,624 years old, and it's considered to be the oldest wetland tree in the world, and it's on a nature conservancy tract that the North Carolina chapter has near, um, near Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, the next species of tree is, uh, that we're gonna look at is a Northern white cedar, one of my favorite trees. Um, Thuya occidentalis and, and um, fairly common in northern Maine. Um, you'll see them, you know, in, in southern Maine, you'll see them in Acadia National Park on some of the trails. Um, they typically like a little bit more limestone, but uh, interesting story. And uh, there's a book that I have it in the reference list called The Last Stand. And it was about a, a university professor who was who was uh, doing some research and he had a uh, student who was actually in high school and one of his summer projects, he says, well, let's go out and core some of these trees. And this is outside of Ottawa, um, I'm sorry, Toronto, Canada. 
And I mean, there's a population of a couple million people out there. And if you're familiar with Ontario, in Southern Ontario, there's not many natural stands of trees. It's all been cut over and put in the farmland and that, or logged and whatever. So um, he was, the professor was really quite surprised when this high school student came back and he had a core sample that was 400 years old. He counted again and counted it again. And they started looking and then he came up with 600 and 800 years. And, and along this Niagara escarpment at the, what's called the Bruce Peninsula, they discovered one tree that was 1,681 years old. And it was only, well, you know, about nine or 10 inches in diameter. And it was growing from a limestone cliff where there was um, water coming down and there were all of the nutrients needed. And uh, in some cases, you know, trees, normally it's green side up. Well, it was the green side was actually pointing down. So, you know, kind of bizarre growth pattern, but um, you can see uh, this tree. I, I, I did a trip up there three or four years ago, uh, Rattlesnake um, Park in Ontario. Uh, and you can see some of these really amazing Northern white cedar trees. And there's probably more discoveries to, to be made. So taking a look at some of the New England trees, this was one that was discovered in southwestern New Hampshire, a place called Pawtuckaway State Park um, uh, four or five years ago. It's an eastern red cedar that's 576 years old and it's named Narwhal. The location is, is not shown because you can see how steep these, uh, these cliffs are here, but there's, there's many um, red, eastern red cedar, juniper, that uh, are found on, on this ridge line at Pawtuckaway State Park. Uh, the oldest broadleaf tree in the east is found in southern New Hampshire. And this is a, a black gum um, or a black tupelo, another name. It's 710 years old. And um, that's a friend of mine, Alan Snyder, who's a wildlife biologist. And we went out to take a look at this particular tree. And, uh, and black gum is, is, is one of my favorite trees. And you do have it in Southern Maine and in particular York County um, where it does grow. So it, it's a very interesting tree. Um, again, one of my favorites. I guess I have a lot of favorite trees, but anyways, uh, it has this alligator bark. That's my GPS unit there. And I could actually slide my fingers in the crevice of the bark. But on the other side, the bark was fairly smooth. So it, it has this unusual bark pattern um, that you see. And here's what the leaves look like. They're typically found in uh, basin swamps, uh, usually with a sandy layer. Uh, that's what they look like in the summer. And this picture was taken on the 15th of September last year on a uh, Tin Mountain Conservation Center in Albany, New Hampshire, where, where Will is, uh, has been a volunteer in the past. Um, it shows you what the beautiful scarlet color of uh, these trees is, is like. Uh, it was never considered to be valuable. Uh, the wood splintered and, and so forth. And it was, you know, corkscrew shapes. It really hard to work. And so there was no great value. So the farmers and the loggers, you know, they just left it. And these, the branches, they tend to grow at right angles to each other. And uh, again, quite, quite gnarly. And we're fortunate that they, they can live to be quite old. So some of these black gum trees are, you know, there's probably some that are older than that New Hampshire specimen that's 700 years uh, plus. Uh, but there are swamps in, um, um, in Maine that you can go and uh, actually have a boardwalk and go and, and see some of these black gum uh, trees. Uh, this is Charlie Cogville. He's a forest ecologist from Marshfield, uh, Vermont. Uh, he's Mr. Spruce. He's done a lot of work in the state of Maine uh, looking at aging trees and looking at old survey records to determine what trees were, were around. So red spruce, uh, one of our common spruce trees in, in uh, northern New England, at least. Uh, the oldest one that we know of is 445 years old. Uh, yellow birch, um, another scientist friend of mine, uh, is 387 years old. And, and sometimes you can't even tell what kind of a tree it is because, you know, you're used to a familiar bark pattern. And uh, on these big trees, the barks are is often quite plated and, and, uh, and a different color. 
Uh, sugar maple trees can live to be quite old, uh, particularly in these old growth forests. And white pine, uh, the oldest that we know of is 408 years old. Uh, this one's in Bradford, New Hampshire. I don't think this one's particularly old. I, you know, it might be 250, 300 years old. Uh, it's quite tall. Actually, the, uh, the town has put um, lightning uh, rods on, on the tree. I don't know who climbed it, but there's an actual lightning rod on, on several of these trees in, in Bradford, New Hampshire. Uh, so I'm, I'm moving on now um, to some of the fossil forests, some of the oldest fossil forests, you know, well over 380 million years old. And this is in New York, uh, Cairo, New York. And there was an article in Smithsonian Magazine back in 2019. I'm sure you can get it at, at the Camden Library uh, and read the article. It's a fascinating article about the oldest fossil forest. And... The pictures came out of that magazine article. Uh, I have yet to visit. I'm hoping to visit here later this uh, next month or, or next year. And, and it's at a sandstone quarry. And so you can actually see the root system, this very early fossil tree. And there's a museum in Gilboa, New York, uh, where you can see another species of uh, old tree. That was thought to be one of the oldest ones um, that they recovered when they were uh, building a reservoir. So that is uh, the conclusion of a uh, journey around North America uh, and, and looking at, at some of our ancient trees and I'll open it up for, for questions here in a minute. It's a bristlecone pine. This is at Cedar Breaks National Monument near um, Cedar City, Utah. Again, worth a trip out to Salt Lake City to see some of these uh, other trees. And I uh, wanted to mention, um, I mentioned one book, The, the, uh, the Last Stand um, by Peter Kelly. This book uh, just came out last year and it was by Valerie Trouet, a uh, Belgian author. Uh, she wrote a book called Tree Story, the Hi History of the World Written in Rings. And you can get it on, on uh, paper copy, hard copy, uh, Kindle or audio. And it is exceptionally well-written. And it's the story about tree rings and it, it'll tell you about the Stradivarius violin and, and all of these other uses of tree ring dating. And, um, and uh, Valerie has uh, you know, quite a history uh, working with tree rings and she's currently working in the Southwest at the tree ring lab at the University of Arizona. So a female scientist and uh, it's, it's, uh, she's done just a, some amazing work. So at that, I will um, end my show here and turn it back over. Thank you so much, David. That was entertaining and fascinating. And I really appreciate your enthusiasm for the subject, which completely deserves the enthusiasm. So thank, <laughs> thank you, you for doing this talk thank tonight. Um, I encourage you all, if you have questions, and I see a lot of familiar names in the participants <laughs> list, so I know you ask good ones, please go ahead and type them into the Q&A uh, icon, and I will be reading those questions aloud in just a moment. I have a question for you first, while we let our, our friends type theirs in. Um, okay. You had mentioned about the 10% of the giant sequoias were recently lost um, in the forest fires in California. And I heard a news story, I think it was yesterday, um, about the drought in California weakening the bark of the sequoias and making them more susceptible to insects and fire. Um, can you talk a little bit about what sort of interventions are happening um, that, you know, what can be done about this? What can we do? Sure. Um, well, giant sequoias are, are relatively fire resistant. They have bark that's up to you know, 16 inches thick. The key thing that you do is, is you don't want other trees to be growing up around them. You get uh, incense cedar and, and various other kinds of trees. And so what the National Park Service has been doing and the Forest Service, they're doing prescribed burning uh, to eliminate these fuel concentrations because the, the tree generally uh, can survive fires and you know, even even in the interior, it's, it's kind of built for that. But the problem is we're in a mega drought in the West. 
And it's gone on for so long that the moisture levels on these trees is, is extremely low. And so they are very, very susceptible to, um, to fires burning hotter and hotter. And um, even where the fuel treatments have done and prescribed burning, you know, over fairly large areas, when you, when you have these conditions where you have 110 degree temperatures, you have relative humidities below 10%. They're burning uphill and you have winds of, you know, 30, 40, 50 miles an hour that are spreading, um, you know, the, the fire embers a half a mile up to a mile ahead. You, you develop these firestorms and fire tornadoes and, and it's, it's, it's really um, a very troubling time for anyone who loves trees and particularly for organizations like Save the Redwoods League who also work to protect these uh, sequoia trees. So, um, you know, the key thing is, is we've got to stop using fossil fuels. We need to be using electric cars and, and get off of our, our fossil fuel addiction because it's these greenhouse gases that are, um, that are warming up the climate. And, and, and unless we can, uh, we can change with, to minimize the, the effects, we're going to have serious problems like this year after year. And we're, what we're already seeing in some of these forests is they're converting from forest to grasslands or shrublands. So that's kind of a long answer um, to that. Well, it's a scary story. And, you know, I appreciate you explaining what some attempts to, you know, intervene are. Uh, let's jump into these questions. So Jermaine says, bristle cone, are the seed cones the female cones after fertilization? A good question, Jermaine. Uh, yes, the uh, female cones are the seed cones. Uh, that's what they, after, after two years, it takes two years for that particular species to, to mature. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mary Jane wants to know, um, why do the bristle cones lose so much of their bark? Uh, Mary Jane, the, the, the answer to that is that there is a nutrient imbalance. These, these dolomite soils are so alkaline that if they had more bark actually on them, they lose their bark primarily through, through wind and things like that, that there's not enough nutrients to actually feed the tree. So if you had a, a tree with 100% of its bark on, it wouldn't be able to absorb enough nutrients. Um, and, and so it would tend to uh, suffer from that. Uh, there's two kinds of bristle cones, by the way. There's a Rocky Mountain bristle cone. They only get to be half as old, maybe 2,500 years old. And that's part of that they, they believe, the scientists believe, is that there's higher nutrient levels in, in Colorado and in northern New Mexico compared to these uh, Great Basin bristle cones. So. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a balancing act, you know, with 10 or 20 or 30 percent of the bark, it's enough to take in the nutrients that are available to keep these trees alive for an indeterminate time. There's no reason that we, we don't have a tree out there that's 5,000 years old. Um, Kit asks, how much more do the bristlecone pines have to go up in uh, have to go up in climate change before they reach the top? Well, it's... Uh, um, it's going to be the, the concern is uh, the dolomite rock. Uh, it's the geology of the air. They could probably go up several hundred more feet and, and still be fine. And then you, you start getting into a different rock type, a sandstone type that's out there. So um, the change is actually you know, slow. It's, it's measured in, in decades uh, that they're slowly moving up. It's the, uh, the, the pinions or uh, pinion junipers that are slowly moving up and trees like limber pines, which typically are found a little bit lower, they're starting to, to come in. And so when you start having these other species come in that will compete with the bristle cone and potentially create a, you know, a more of a, a, a fuel ladder or uh, for fire. So, so that's also a concern. Thank you. Um, Anne was asking for a little clarification, and we just might not have heard you right. You were talking about a particular tree uh, that was growing counter to what we normally hear. You said marine side up or green side up. Oh, green. <laughs> we, we weren't yeah. able to really hear it clearly. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, trees normally, if they're green side up, you know, whenever I worked with planting crews, we're planting trees, I always have to instruct them green side up, you know, the root side is, uh, is that. So, so these trees, they're suspended on cliffs. And because of gravity, they 
actually start growing where the green side is, is lower than the root system. But because there's moisture on these limestone cliffs, that um, some of these trees are actually uh, pointing down. Um, Stephen earlier had, uh, in the very beginning, I think when you were talking about the location of the bristlecone pine forest, um, he had mentioned that it's near Big Pine, not Lone Pine. Lone Pine is farther south near Mount Whitney, um, but he said it is near Bishop. So, yeah, yeah that's that, that's fine to me. It, it, it's I was staying in um, in Lone Pine. And, and of course, Big Pine is, is closer and Bishop's a little bit uh, further north. Uh, that whole area uh, is just a gorgeous area. Mammoth Lakes, um, beautiful area. One of the places I wouldn't mind living, uh, of course, there is some volcanic activity there. So <laughs> <laughs> you always have to look at that. Yeah, so there's, there's you know, things that detract from yeah. everywhere. You but but thank you for that uh, correction <laughs> on the geography. Yeah. Okay, Vicki says, in New England, what level of protection do these ancient trees have? Um, it depends. And, and the level of protection, if they're in a national park, um, you know, they're fully protected, um, uh, such as Acadia National Park. But they're really, um, there, there isn't, um, you know, in some of the states, and I'm more familiar with New Hampshire, you know, we, we don't have any statutory legislation to protect old growth forests that are on, on state lands. I mean, the, the state foresters, you know, do protect these, they're aware of them. Um, and in, I suspect in, in, in Maine, it's, it's similar. You have Baxter State Park with uh, Katahdin and, and of course, uh, you know, majority of that wonderful park is, is protected. Um, but I'm not sure we know where all of these really old trees are. Yeah. And, and that's why it's important for uh, people to, you know, to go out and, and to find these and, uh, and reading some of these books and learning about the stories of other explorers, you know, we can, we can find that and we can, you know, honor these uh, elder trees. Absolutely. Um, Jan says, is David willing to share his contact information and email address for sending further questions? Um, and before you answer that, I do want to let you know, Jan and everyone else who's on this call, um, the, the email that you received that has the Zoom link uh, that you joined with today, the one that was sent about an hour before the program, um, there is an attachment of a resource that uh, David created. And at the very bottom of it is his email address. But David, did you want to share it in other ways as well? Uh, sure. It's, um, I have a Gmail address and it's uh, david.govatsky at gmail.com. And um, you can get a hold of Julia or yes. Will and, 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 and they can share it. I, I'd be happy to hear from you if you have any questions or you want some elaboration on um, any of these topics, I'd be happy to try to answer them. I, I'm I don't uh, proclaim to be the leading expert in, in deodor or uh, dendrochronology, but um, I, I have a pretty good background on, on trees, so I'd be happy to help. Thank you. We have one uh, attendee who's raising her hand, so I'm going to see if we can try to unmute her. Uh, Carol, I'm going to hit allow to talk. This doesn't always work, so bear with me, <laughs> but um, here we go. So Carol, you can try to ask your question. I'm asking you to unmute now. Yeah, I apologize. That doesn't always seem to work. Um, Carol, if you have any issues and you'd like to um, send us your question, we can forward that to, um, to David and, and get you an answer. I apologize for that feature not working. Um, with that, I want to say Maureen's final comment, and that is wonderful presentation. And I wholeheartedly agree. That certainly was. Um, I learned a lot from that. And I know that everyone here this evening did as well. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Will Broussard, and he's going to tell you just a little bit more for those of you who may have signed on late about the Midcoast Audubon and um, about what's coming up next for Midcoast Audubon. Yeah, thanks, thanks. everyone. Thanks again. Thanks again, David. Um, this is a wonderful presentation. Um, just a recap for those of us who didn't get to hear it earlier um, in the presentation. Um, so Maine Audubon, we're an affiliate chapter, uh, 
Midcoast Audubon is an affiliate chapter of Maine Audubon. Um, and we have a couple programs coming up this month. Um, this fall, I should say, Eric Masterson is going to be speaking on October 21st on um, the subject of nocturnal flight calls. Um, he is stationed down in southwest New Hampshire and has a nocturnal flight call station at his house. So he's going to be telling us about um, various lessons he's learned about the birds migrating over his house at night, which is really exciting. Um, and then Paul Bannock, who is an ex uh, excellent photographer, is going to be speaking about um, a talk that he titled A Year in the Lives of North American Owls on November, November 18th um, through stunning photography. Um, I've looked uh, him up. He's got an excellent story, excellent uh, background photography and all of the owls in North America. So that's going to be really exciting. Um, and we do have field trips to Popham Beach and Sabatis Pond coming up over the next month and a half to kind of um, and check in with the migrant uh, songbirds and ducks and other um, other birds coming through the fall season. So that's going to be really exciting. And all of this information is available on our website. So uh, Midcoast uh, Audubon's website. Uh, so we're really excited to have such a great turnout tonight. And I hope we get to see many of you in person for some of our um, walks and uh, and uh, programs coming up through the through the year. So thank you. Thanks, Will. And again, you can register uh, same way you did this one, either on the Midcoast Audubon's website or through librarycamden.org slash events on our events calendar. We'll have the link there also. And while you're at librarycamden.org, check out all the other great programs we have coming up and please join us for some of them too. We've got a lot of cool talks and October is history month. So if you're a history fan, we've got a lot of neat stuff coming up. Okay, so please join us for future Midcoast Audubon talks. We're having them all fall and winter every third Thursday. That's easy to remember. Um, David, once again, this was tremendous. Thank you for your time and for the excellent work you've done with the Forest Service. Good night, everyone.